Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Infosys's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Infosys is an Indian technology company that provides business consulting, information technology, and outsourcing services. The company was started by seven engineers with initial capital of $250 back in 1981. In 2012, it opened an office in Milwaukee, Wisconsin to serve Holly Davidson. The company hired 1,200 U.S. workers that year and added 2,000 more in 2013. In 2018, it opened an office in Indianapolis, Indiana, creating 2,000 U.S. jobs. Infosys provides software development, maintenance, and independent validation services to companies in finance, insurance, manufacturing, and many more areas. One of its known products is Finical, which is a universal banking solution with various modules for retail and corporate banking. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 74 billion market cap. They're trading at $18 a share and they have 4.2 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has a lot of free cash flow and it seems to be growing. It goes from 1.9 billion to 2.8 billion. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. They have pretty strong and consistent net income. Revenue is a sales for the company and that grows nicely from 10.9 billion to 13.1 billion. They also have really good net profit margins. Net profit margins are net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. In the trailing 12 months, they converted 19% of their revenue into profit which means 81% went towards expenses. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The difference between those two numbers is their gross profit. And their gross profit was the highest in the trailing 12 months at four and a half billion. It was 3.9 billion back in 2018. Below that is operating expenses. Examples of operating expenses are depreciation and research and development. Then below that is operating income, and their operating income also peaked in the trailing 12 months at $3.1 billion. So it looks like they don't have any interest payments on their debt. They did have debt in prior years. We'll see that on a statement of cash flows. And below that is other income and expenses. Then below that is their pre-tax income. That was the highest in the trailing 12 months at $3.4 billion then taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And the company's doing a good job at generating net income. They're over $2 billion every year. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And this company has a good amount of free cash flow each year. About half their free cash flow goes towards paying dividends, but they also use the free cash flow to buy back stock, as you can see here, to pay down debt and also to invest back into their business. The company paid down $80 million of debt in 2020 and $90 million in a trailing 12 months. They also bought back a lot of stock, $2 billion in 2018, $100 million in 2019, and $1 billion in 2020. When a company buys back stock, it decreases the shares outstanding making the remaining shares more valuable. It's another way to reward investors. There's two main ways to reward investors, pay a dividend or to buy back stock. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. If you cannot generate cash flow from your operational business, you don't have much of a business. And this company generates lots of operating cash flow. Net income is your accounting profit and loss. There's a lot of non-cash items on the income statement. The way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, that was two and a half billion. Then you have to add back the depreciation of 400 million. 
Depreciation is a non-cash expense that brings down your net income, but you have to add it back on the CFO section. They also had $900 million of deferred taxes and a $34 million asset impairment. An asset impairment is when you decrease the value of an asset on your balance sheet and pass through the loss onto your income statement. But this is also a non-cash item, so you have to add it back on a CFO section. So even though the company reported a $2.5 billion profit, they actually generated over $3 billion from the operational business. Let's look at the capital structure. $8.7 billion of equity, $600 million of debt. Their 93% equity, 7% debt. And their net debt is negative $2.5 billion. So they can pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have $2.5 billion of cash left over. Their WAC is 7% and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimate a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for them. That's $66 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $59 billion. We divide that by 4.2 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $14. They're trading at $18, so they're trading at a 26% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street is much lower than me. They're at $8.15 a share. They're saying it's really overvalued. I think my future free cash flow estimate is pretty conservative based off of their past. But my intrinsic stock price is still below where they're trading at. You can see if I did a video on this company about six months ago, it would have been a buy. But the stock price has come up so much, so now it's a sell. So you can see the stock was pretty flat for a few years, but the past few months it's done really well. This company pays two dividends a year, and their dividend payment is 1.7%. They pay out 49% of their net income and 45% of their free cash flow. This company has a pretty low beta, 0.62, so the stock moves less than the market. It's not volatile at all. And the stock has done really well the past 52 weeks, up 61%. The S&P 500 is up 16% in the same time frame. The 52-week low was $7, the high was $19. And the stock is trading a little above its 50-day moving average, a lot above its 200-day moving average. And this is a fairly liquid stock. About 6 to 8 million shares are traded each day. And of the 4.2 billion shares outstanding, 3.6 billion are on float. 18% of the shares are held by institutions. And less than 1% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have been down for a few years and you might have sold because you were upset. But if you would have held out, you could have more than doubled your money. You would have been at $26,000 today. Deutsche Bank is the biggest shareholder at 17%. Then Life Insurance Corp of India is the second biggest shareholder at 6%. Then BlackRock. Then their former executive vice chairman, Chris Gopala Krishnan, owns 3.2% of the stock. The 3.2% isn't owned by him, it's owned by his company that funds startups. And then 3% is ICICI Bank. Prudential and this Indian bank established a joint venture, and that joint venture owns 3% of the shares. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market's 10, the median is 15, PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 29.8, so investors are paying $30 for $1 of earnings. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 5.7, so they're between the median and average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 8.6, so they're worse than the median and average. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet, and they have $8.7 billion of equity. 7.7 .7 billion of tangible equity because they have 700 million of goodwill on their balance sheet and 250 million of other intangibles on their balance sheet. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They can easily cover their interest payments. ROE is net income over equity. They have a really good ROE at 29%. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They can cover their current liabilities two and a half times. And their current assets are $3 billion of cash and $3.7 billion of receivables. So the company is well capitalized. They had $2.8 billion of free cash flow, $4.5 billion of working capital. They have a $1.2 billion dividend payment. So they have about $6 billion of funding. So the company doesn't need any debt to run its business, but they may take on debt if they want to acquire another business.
The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos of 13 companies in the same industry as Infosys. And if the company has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're worse in PE and price of sales because their stock price has come up so much in the past few months. So the price multiples look worse now, but they do have a better price to book than the average. They have a really high current ratio. They're doing great in ROE. They're doing amazing in debt. And they're a really big company, 74 billion market cap. They're twice the size as the average company and their dividend is higher than average. So to summarize, I do have them trading at a 26% premium, mainly because their stock price has become so inflated the past few months, but that doesn't mean it can't go higher. This company has really good fundamentals. They've also been around for 40 years, so I don't think they're going anywhere, and they have a $74 billion market cap. I rank their free cash flows nine out of 10. They have really strong free cash flows, and they're growing a lot, especially during the pandemic. Their revenue, I rank eight out of 10. They also have really strong revenue. It is growing at a fairly small rate and their ratios are really good. I rank them eight out of 10. Their price multiples are a little high, but they're not terrible. They have a great ROE. They're doing great in debt and not a lot of companies are able to grow at this rate without taking on any debt. So they're doing a great job. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.